Good morning, everybody. I'm Darren Kagan, creator and host of DarrenKagan.com. I was also an anchor on CNN for 12 years and am now a small business owner myself. When I left the world of doom and gloom, I launched a company that's all about creating content that's all positive and uplifting news stories that you can find at DarrenKagan.com. Yay for positive and uplifting, yay. Uh, <laughs> I do have a page that's exclusively uplifting business news, if you can believe that. There's a lot of stories out there. Um, I know from launching my own company, it's about money. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another to have money and get money. So that's what we're talking about today, getting started with that. How do you do it? How do you go to the next level? And uh, the folks at Dun & Bradstreet have gathered a tremendous panel, a combination of business people and the money guys. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk for about 30 minutes and then the thinking of your great questions because we're going to open it up after 30 minutes. I want to start with uh, somebody who has a great story himself. Who can't relate with a guy who started his successful business in his basement here in Atlanta? That is uh, Mark Wilson. So Mark, tell us a little bit about your company and about the now famous basement. Well, <laughs> um, well uh, I had the opportunity, and I'm in my second company now, E-Verifile, but the previous venture was um, a call center business that uh, got started uh, really out of my roots with Dun & Bradstreet. I uh, worked there for 15 years and did a variety of things, mostly around call centers and operations in the call center world, and had an opportunity as DMB decided to make a decision to outsource that work to uh, be a partner for them. And so I took advantage of that opportunity, met with the, the leadership at DMB, and um, in the end was able to, to uh, have a contract with them. And, and that led to us starting that business and growing it over uh, 10 years. And uh, we exited that business in 2010 and was the catalyst for the, the second business, which today is eVerifile. And, and what does eVerifile do? We're um, in the background screening business. We basically provide pre-employment background screening as well as contractor uh, vetting for all of our customers. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, in both those ventures, uh, we were partnered uh, with uh, private equity uh, from Frontier Capital, which Andrew Lindor on the panel uh, represents, and so I'm pretty sure he'll talk about that. We'll be talking about that. David Rudolph is our next guest, or victim, depending on how this goes. Um, David, you're a fascinating story because you were a corporate guy, you had the corporate job, and you took a product that you developed within Turner Broadcasting and took it and bought it and created your own company. So tell us what that's about. Yeah, I, I, I moved to Atlanta to go to Georgia Tech and uh, like most folks thought TV was kind of interesting and mm -hmm. Turner Broadcasting was right across the street so I interned there and, and kind of started in the sports production. I uh, had the best job I probably will ever have which is cutting highlights for NFL games uh, when <laughs> TNT had the Sunday night package but that's how I got introduced to entertainment. Um, this was a business that we started inside play on sports we started inside of Turner it was focused on the collegiate space. Uh, we saw coming what's happened over the last three or four years in terms of rights fee escalation and conference realignment and that sort of thing. And knew we needed to change the focus of the business, but knew that was going to be hard to do inside of Turner. So I made the smart, although some people would call it crazy, decision to leave and purchase the business from Turner um, and to, to spin it. It's essentially called a spin out. Uh, and then once we had it outside to refocus it, Took on private equity, Sig Mosley there at the end was my first investor and, a, and a continues to be an investor. Sig's seen the whole transformation from those, uh, those early days and it's gone through quite a bit, but that was about four and a half years ago. And today, uh, a lot of folks describe us as the ESPN for high school sports. So that's, that's what we focus on is the high school category uh, and we produce and distribute content primarily in a digital capacity. We don't, we don't do a ton of television, but we do a lot of uh, online digital distribution of sports content. So we'll be coming back to both of you guys talking about the difference between do you go for equity, do you, do you look for an angel fund, what the difference is, how do you do that, how did you guys do that successfully. First though, I want to move on to Daryl Dollinger. He's with Big Game Brands. Anybody who's eaten in, in uh, the Atlanta area knows Flying Biscuit, knows uh, Monkey Joe's if you've had kids who have gone to parties, um, two of the brands that your company owns. And your company is an entree for people trying to be an entrepreneur because if they want to be a franchisee. Correct. Uh, big game brands, Flying Biscuit and Monkey Joe's are, are franchise companies that are just about 100% franchised uh, around the United States. We've got 14 locations for Flying Biscuit in Raleigh, Charlotte, Atlanta, and Gainesville, Florida. 
and 63 Monkey Joe's locations, which are pretty much all over the eastern half of the United States. And we, we assist our franchisees with funding through a lot of different banks, anywhere from the SBA to there's a lot of different fundings out there today for veterans and military personnel. And uh, it's been a, cup, a tough couple of years over the last six or seven years that we've been doing it, but we're finally now seeing the doors open up a little bit, uh, assisting our franchisees with finding you know, the, the good funding so they can start their new business. And we'll talk to you more about that and how folks might be able to do that in a second. Lance Weatherby is our movie star, who you just saw in our video. Um, also kind of our hybrid on the panel, because you've worked both sides. You, you know how to go ask for money, and then you've worked with the people who give money. So tell yeah. us a little bit more beyond the video. Yeah, so um, I have some experience working, actually helping entrepreneurs for about five years. I was at a Georgia Tech at a place called the Advanced Technology Development Center, which is a organization that essentially helps entrepreneurs launch and build technology companies. And a lot of those discussions that, that we had was, you know, how do I get money to, to, to make my idea happen? So I spent about five years doing that, been in the technology um, space for about 15 years over, overall, and the most recent experience, which you saw in the video, um, which in crowd, which was really born out of a publishing company that was um, failing um, due to the demise of, of that industry, and the basic premise that local merchants need some place to advertise um, on the internet because the way that they used to do that has now gone away. Okay, let's show you the money. That's why we're here. So let's go to the money guys. <laughs> Andrew Lindner is with Frontier Capital, which is an equity fund. And Sig Mosley is with Imlay Investments, which is an angel fund. If you could both talk about what that is and what's the difference between equity and angel and the kind of investments each of your companies look for, please. Sure. Um, just a quick backdrop. Mm -hmm. we, uh, Frontier, we've been around for about 14 years. Um, we're most, uh, most recently investing out of our third fund, which is a $250 million fund. Um, and that probably describes the, the difference in stage is, is the sort of size check someone writes and the, and the stage a company in which you invest in. So um, we, are, we are probably most famous for bringing Mark Wilson out of the closet into daylight. Um, no, uh, I but, think it's um, the basement is what you meant. That's a different kind of panel. Well, what's that? I'm sorry? <laughs> you just bought him out of the closet. That's a different kind of panel. Oh, did I say out of the yes, closet? I'm sorry, I'm at the basement. I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. Um, um, uh, this panel's getting fun. It is. Right? Whoa, okay. Um, but no, that's a good example. Of Mark's company was seeded with some more angel money when it was more of a concept and kind of a one contract company. Um, Mark did a great job building it up to about a $10 million revenue business at the time. We invested. And then um, we invested to provide a little bit of liquidity to some of the early sort of angel shareholders and to put capital on the balance sheet to help him, you know, grow the business to the next level, which he did um, very well and took it from, you know, 100, uh, excuse me, 10 million to about 100 million of revenue, at which time we sold the business. So hopefully that, well that gives you a little flavor. <laughs> and then Sig, if you can talk about what it is to be an angel. Well, to begin with, I've been doing this for about 30 years. So an angel will tend to invest much earlier than VCs today, venture capital tend to invest later on once the companies get up and has some, generally some revenue, tip, typically about a million dollars. Angels will come in, you know, generally the company may have a prototype, it may have a bigger customer or two, and we'll put in less money than a venture capitalist will, but we'll get, we'll be in there earlier and work with the entrepreneur to get it to the point that a venture capital will come in and put in. So Emily did that for 25 years, and now Mosley Ventures is picking up with Emily Lutt and they're continuing to do the angel type investment in the technology area here in Atlanta. Uh, I have done some 125 deals over the 30 years. So what do you look for? Uh, I look for an entrepreneur who has passion, ability, and is coachable. And what was that last thing? Coachable. Coachable. And what makes somebody coachable? Uh, <laughs> that is a good question. You know it when you see it. Okay, <laughs> that it factor. <laughs> Clearly, David had it. Yes, David had it. Uh, 
David and I had several meetings before <laughs> I got to the point of being ready. David were very coachable from the very beginning. It was just a question of figuring out exactly what kind of deal he needed to put together and what would the size of the deal. Um, okay, let's follow your guys' journey a little bit. So David, there you are working at Turner and you're working on this product. What was it? Did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Did you get an idea? Did your boss tick you off? Like, What, what was it about that that motivated you to, to think kind of outside the box and say, well, I could work for a company for the rest of my life or I could kind of go out and have this adventure? Well, I think now, five years later, looking back, no, this is something I always wanted to do. I don't, I don't know that I knew it at the time. I, my kind of personal story is a little bit crazy. We just had our first child, so it was perfect timing to <laughs> leave corporate America and venture out on your own, and the economy had also <laughs> just imploded. Um, so my, my timing is, is perfect. But it was, I had an opportunity to stay at Turner, and, but I would have been locked in for another three-year contract, and, and this sounds silly, but it happened to me. My hand physically would not sign the document. So... I took that as a sign if I need to go do something different. And luckily, there was a product inside the company that I'd worked on that I really believed in that I thought had a lot of opportunity. Um, and it all kind of worked out where I had the opportunity to take that product and spin it out and, and, and have a lot more flexibility outside of a big corporation than, than uh, we would have inside. But you needed money, so how did you meet somebody like Sig? Uh, well, I mean, if you're raising money in Atlanta and it has technology attached to it, everyone meets SIG. Uh, <laughs> so I, for me, it was starting from scratch. I, I, I had been in a, in a big company the whole time. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't even really know how to write a business plan to raise money. But um, you just you start, you know, and if I think SIG said a, right, a great word. If you're coachable, if you listen, you know, if you're bullheaded and just say, this is my idea, just give me money you're going to get a thousand doors slammed in your face. But if you'll listen to the feedback, a lot, you'll start to hear a lot of the same feedback. Hey, we'd want to see this. We'd like to see that. Uh, and if you're willing to make those adjustments, uh, then there are folks locally who are willing to, to take a chance early on. And then after that, it's you've got to prove it. You've got to, you got to prove the company. You've got to prove the value proposition. You've got to prove the revenue stream. Um, and I've, that, that's all been a journey, too. But that, that's kind of later okay, in the story. Um, Mark, let's go back down to your basement. Um, so you did have some angel money to start. Did you have your own private savings? What did you do? Yeah, um, early on it was it was really difficult to, to try to find sources of capital. And um, what what happened was I found a small business consulting group here. Who was, they're no, they no longer exist, but I, they helped me to you know to write a business plan that we put out. And actually, uh, Frontier looked at the plan, but we were too early stage, and they actually passed. Oh. Um, and, but we, we were able to find some seed capital from, you know, a different breed of money. There's community development, uh, venture capitalism that's out there. It's, um, these are funds that have a double bottom line. So that they invest in companies for a social reason as well as a, uh, mm -hmm. a financial return. And so we found this company that was over in Raleigh, Sustainable Jobs Fund. And, and they were investing in companies that were going to produce sustainable jobs for which we had a plan for. Um, and so um, that was, the, you know, the first round we got $4 million. And so Andrew and his team followed us. Ah, okay. So a in, no might eventually be a yes. Yeah, your, it did. As your case shows. It did. So they followed us for, you know, three, four years. And we kept in touch. They, he and members of his team would check in with me to see how we were doing. And we reached an, an inflection point that they felt interesting um, in terms of our growth. And so that opened the conversation back up, and and so we, you know, put the plan together again to pre to present to them, and they wound up um, in that round we ra we raised seven million, uh, and that was the catalyst for us to you know to to grow. Do what as, you did. Yeah, yeah. Great, Lance. Let's bring you in because, as I said, you've been on both sides um, working on this. How does a company or how does a person know if they should be looking for an angel fund or for an equity partner? Well, I think these guys explained it, you know, fa fairly well that, you know, it depends on the size of your company. You know, Sid kind of bets on a team and an idea, and my guess if you ask him, he's going to say he looks at the market as well, and, you know, is there a big opportunity here? And, you know, the big opportunity is typically one of those things that's just apparent. Like when I first saw the Internet, it was like, everybody's going to want to do this. This is, there's huge opportunities here. Um, and, and they look at that. And, you know, as you um, get customers somehow, right, you know, whatever it takes for you to get some customers and to 
um, build some repeatable processes, somebody like Andrew or somebody that invests a little bit you know, less than Andrew, you know, they're going to say, oh, okay, if I, if I give you this money, you know, this is what you're going to do with it. And I, I believe you because you've done that with it in the past and you just need more. So I think it kind of depends on, on the stage of, of, your, of your business where um, you need small chunks to kind of get going. Mm -hmm. And then you, you want to get a bigger chunk when you're trying to accelerate your growth. And that's really you know, the reason why you want to take the money is to, is to grow faster in my mind. Um, and Daryl, let's bring you back in here. So some people, they're, they might have an original idea. They might be in their basement. They might be at a company. But you're in the business of saying you actually don't have to have an original idea. It, you could find a kind of ready-made package and get a franchise. How yeah. do you get that opportunity? Well, I think, I think the key with franchising, why franchising is so popular, is because there are a lot of great franchise concepts out there. And I think all of us would probably agree, you know, growing up, there's so many concepts out there you didn't know for even franchise companies, but believe it or not, almost everything out there that's retail is somehow involved with licensing or franchising. And I think if, if a person has passion, if a person has experience in that field, whether it be restaurant, whether it be retail, whether it be you know, home -base, a home-based business, the opportunity to franchise is there. I think How do you tell a good franchise? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, a lot of indicators. I think one, the number of locations they have. And I think digging into that a little bit, if, if you're going to join a franchise company or consider it, you have to do some really strong due diligence. You have to talk to some of the existing franchisees. Um, and obviously today with the internet, you can find out a lot of good information. But very much like angel investing, there's a lot of good ideas out there. And there's one or two locations that are franchised up open in public. Uh, and those are bigger risks, but it's also being on the ground floor, being able to expand. There's many examples, mostly you can know of the sandwich concepts out there that they sell you know, states and counties, and you can't get in even if you wanted to, uh, unless it's a second, you know, someone sold it to you. And a new generation concept or a new concept that you can get in on the ground floor. And for us as a company, that is the way we've always made our money because we become very appealing to those who, oh, that's a great idea, and then they get behind the passion of the owners, the passion of the people operating it, and we've done that very well in this town for the past 16 years. I would imagine a lot of folks come to see you interested in getting a franchise, and they, they're coming from all walks of life. Like you, you mentioned veterans, but it might be that, they be, be that they've been in the business world doing nothing that has to do with restaurants or entertainment. What kind of advice do you give them besides money? Like go work in one or? <laughs> well, no, it's a great, it's a great <laughs> question. And I, I, if we had hours, I could talk about it because <laughs> I have those conversations every day. Uh, we do a lot of online lead generation and I can't tell you, I, I talk to retired people who have tons of money, who want to put their kids in business, who have no experience, but they have money. Uh, I have people who have experience from that particular industry, mostly the restaurant industry, and they think they could just run their restaurant. And then you have the hybrid people who have been working for someone else. They see an opportunity, and then they call asking a lot of great, you know, great questions, but they get really turned off when you hear it's going to be a three or four or five hundred thousand dollar investment to get a restaurant or a facility open. So, you know, but 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 going back to what you said, there's people from all walks of life. And, and that's what excites me because I, I've been very fortunate to help make a lot of people a lot of money over the years. People who I have from my old company, Moe's, that I was with who have 9, 10, 11, 12 locations. I spoke to someone yesterday up in New York and he's got you know, 10 locations and they're all doing 1.5 million a piece on average. And I hear that and I just, I, I'm like in tears. It's like, wow, you know, and it's been 10 years. You helped create that. Yeah, helped create it yeah. and, and help, help make him. And he saw my passion and I saw his and the relationship. I, I still talk to them. So it's, but all walks of life. And, uh, and, and it's very much like the angel thing, you know, trying to find, they have to be the angel that wants to go invest their own money or go find it in my concept. Uh, let's get back to the money because money's not free. <laughs> so Andrew, when you, when your company gives money, what are you, what are you buying? Uh, can we stop using the term gives? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> sell money. What's the right, what's the right verb? Invest. Okay. No, that's good. When your company invests money, what do you, what do you expect in exchange? Um, well, at the end of the day, a return to okay. us and therefore to our investors. I mean, I think people sometimes forget, um, 
you know, the people running these funds, whether it be an early stage venture fund, whether it be a growth stage fund like us, whether it be a buyout fund, is that, um, you know, we have to go raise that fund as well. And there are certain, um, you know, we've agreed to certain terms and um, philosophies around how long, you know, we're going to uh, take to invest this money and, and in what types of companies and how long we're going to have to return it back to them. So, at the end of the day, we're looking for a return on that capital. Specifically, it's you know three to five x kind of return on on invested capital. Um, we're in a risky business, so you don't always get that. So that allows for uh, you know the investments that don't um, that don't work out. But in our case, we're um, when you ask what we're looking for, and again, ultimately, it is that kind of a return that we then pass on to our investors and take take a uh, cut of the the gains ourselves. But in our case, we're um, primarily a non-control investor. So we're not buying companies, but similar to SIG, we're investing into a high growth business to maybe provide a little liquidity to, to both the, the sort of you know, friends and family that may have got that company off the ground or a smaller mm -hmm. venture fund that, that got it off the ground, um, but also to the entrepreneur. I mean, when you've reached the stage at which we invest 10 million or so of revenue, sometimes we go a little earlier, but, but not much. Um, you know, typically the business is, you know, is not uh, is not quite ready for prime time. I mean, to go sell the business, and and the founder operators done a great job, you know, scraping and clawing and getting it to that stage, and they deserve to take a few chips chips off the table. We think it's a very healthy thing to kind of um, allow one to play both sides of the ball, play some offense instead of just defense. But I can't hire that next salesperson because I just don't have the cash flow yet to do it, and and to put that money on the balance sheet and allow them to take a few chips off the table actually makes them a lot more strategic. Right. So when you invest this money, though, are you just saying, oh, you know, here's money to buy, have a good time, or are you calling Mark and saying, telling him what kind of paper clips to order? I don't know. You want to ask Mark that question? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in between, Darren. I mean, it's um, we're personally we're very active kind of board members. Uh huh. So you're um, a board member of his company. Because mm -hmm. like I noticed when we were back in the green room and you were talking about some update on some company. You asked him something, he said, oh, is that one of ours? Mm -hmm. Like, you think of what's happening with his company as your company Yeah, it's as a good well. pickup. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's interesting you pick up on it. But yeah, we do. I it is. Drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's your business. <laughs> um, no, it is, especially when you're, I mean, we, we sometimes say, you know, because we're not buying the company and telling you, and by the way, we're not <laughs> operators, I and mean, we operate our own business, so I'm a small business operator yeah. and, and running Frontier, but... Um, we're not going to come in and tell you how to run your business day to day. If you need us to do that, then we're probably not a good fit for each other. But, you know, with strategy, with, you know, hiring some of the right people, organizational design, those sorts of things, that's where we get involved. And, you know, we, we sometimes say because we're a non-control investor, you know, look, it's your company. We're an invited guest on the board, and I may own 30, 40, 50 percent of your company, but at the end of the day, it's your company. And um, so the other thing we're looking for, similar to SIG, I mean, we are looking for a Sounds trite and cliche, but we are looking for a relationship where we can, you know, we are that invited guest. We are, if you're going to sell your company, it's like selling your home, we sometimes say, you know, go hire a broker, sell it to the highest. But if you're going to bring a boarder in to live in the guest room, you better know, you know, <laughs> who that person is and, and the two of you better have, you know, alignment in terms of um, what you're trying to build here, um, you know, what's your philosophy, what are your ethics and principles, those sorts of things, we, we need to understand that about each other. So we, so we look for those things as well. And, and frankly, I don't think we would invest behind a company that didn't do some sort of due diligence on us as well. That's always sort of a, it's a red flag when someone isn't doing diligence on us. If they're going to take our capital, they're going to get it. They're not going to get the paperclip order, but they're <laughs> going to get a lot more than just an ATM machine. So Got it. Sig, so you have seen and heard it all. What's the worst pitch or worst thing you've ever heard of somebody coming to you, either with an idea, well, don't say their idea, because what if they're here, good gosh, but um, the, the worst way um, of people approaching you for money? Well, when they come and they have no idea what they really are doing, and, and believe it or not, people do come like that. Uh, <laughs> like, I just want to start an internet company and make a lot of money, can oh, I have uh, some money? Well, we, we, I have had one guy come and he had an idea about a new bicycle. He had a new bicycle. Right. Okay. And he, he knew how much he was going to sell it for. He had no idea where he was going to sell it. He knew he had no idea what it was going to cost to sell it. But he knew what he was going to sell it for. And that did particular time was when two major bicycle companies had gone bankrupt. 
And so I sent him back to his basement. And I said, well, when you figure out who will carry your bike and who will make your bike and what it will cost, come back and talk to me. I haven't seen him in 25 <laughs> years. So uh, he's still working I, I, on I think he's concluded that I didn't think he had very much. Still working but on The major thing for an entrepreneur is most of them really don't know their competitors. Because you have two types of competitors those who you compete with today and those who you may compete with tomorrow. And if you don't know those, then you don't know your market. And if you don't know your market, then you don't know your product. And if you don't know your product, then you don't know what you can sell it for. So then you really don't know your business. So, so you're not ready. Lance, you've <laughs> raised a lot of money over the years. What's the biggest mistake you ever made? Golly, I, <laughs> I never really... Um, raised money myself. I, I've wrote my. I've wrote some checks that mm -hmm. didn't turn out too well. <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, I've, I've helped people raise money before. Um, and the the biggest mistake that I see people make over and over again is trying to go after too much money before they're ready for it. They oftentimes it seems like they're a stage ahead. Of, of where they need to be. You know, when they should be talking to someone like, like Sig, um, they're talking to Andrew. And they spend a lot of time talking to the Andrews of the world, and they need to be talking to, to Sig, or they spend a lot of time talking to Sig, and they, they need to figure out how to, to run up a credit card bill um, to get it going. So it, it just seems like they're, they want to be one step ahead of, of where they get, get their money, and the best place to go get money is the type of money that really doesn't cost you anything. It's from a customer. You know, they're going to write you a check, and they're not going to take any equity, or, and they're not going to have any debt. But and then you can show cash flow, which helps you get to the next. Yeah, I mean that's the best. I mean that's the best way to do it in any business, in my mind. Mark, let's go back to the to the basement when you were start when you were starting. What um, what do you wish you could tell that that man? that was just starting? Like, what have you learned with the journey that you've had? Uh, there, there are definitely a lot of learnings. <laughs> um, but Especially I think when I, it comes to money and getting money. Sure. And selling uh, and, and the price of money. Sure. I think it would, I would distill it down to, to not be afraid of uh, raising the money. Um, I share a little bit of a different view about uh, the need for it. Um, because it's, and particularly in uh, the industry that we were operating in, the need for cash was tremendous. And, and without access to it, it, it would not have been possible for us to grow and scale the business. Um, and so, you know, I would say, you know, have a healthy understanding of that and not be afraid of, uh, of, of actually seeking out the money and what that might do to, you know, uh, you know, the ownership position that you have in your business. And so said differently, a lot of folks fear that if I were to partner with private equity or with a group of angels that I give up my company mm -hmm. because of that and, and, and therefore don't pursue it like maybe they should. Um, I think in, in the end, cash is definitely king and it does provide, you know, avenue for you to do different and creative things toward the growth of your business. And so... You know, I, I would say, you know, have a, a great and healthy understanding of the importance of cash and the things that you need to do to attract it, being very disciplined, organized about how it is that you present yourself as a business. Uh, and I think that that's something that's somewhat overlooked as well, that, you know, the example was given about the person asking for money and not really understanding the market mm -hmm. or, you know, what the opportunity is. I would advise against that and, you know, to make sure that you are studious on what it, what's needed to, uh, to be presentable uh, to someone that, that has the cash that you're, that you're uh, trying to attract. Did either of you two realize how much you had to know? Um, um, if you look back now, do you laugh at how little you knew when you thought, like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious, yeah. to, be, to be honest. Uh, I knew nothing, really. I mean, yeah. I knew what I learned in, 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 in corporate world about business and how business operated, yeah. but, but definitely not to the degree I needed to around finance. And that's why I say be studious about that and have a healthy appreciation and understanding for that, you know, how important it is 
for the growth and development of your company. Um, I would do that all over again. I would know more. I would be. I would have a better understanding. I've learned a lot now, and you know, and I was fortunate to have great partners on the finance side. I don't. I don't say that just because Andrew and his team are here, and because mm -hmm. they invest in my company now. Yeah. But, uh, but it's the truth. Uh, I was fortunate then, and and you know, fact is, in a lot of cases, you, not everybody is as fortunate. And if you don't know going in, it could cost you. Well, thank you. If you're here, it means you have a big dream. So good luck with your dreams, and maybe one day you'll be sitting up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us.